Hi folks, this is Jason. Hope you're okay today. It's good to be with you. And uh, love to everybody out there. Uh, I'm doing a Google Hangout. And basically, I am going to be talking about uh, two, sub two, three subjects tonight um, that I want to look at. Um, I want to look at uh, these subjects because... because um, I was doing evangelism uh, in my home city and basically um, I had a couple of debates with Muslims. One Muslim seemed to be uh, uh, wanted to invite me to uh, have a, a friendly discussion with Shabir Ali or somebody who's a famous Muslim apologist that came to my city um, this week and this guy wanted me to go and meet uh, this famous Muslim apologist and put some questions to him but I, I wasn't able to go um, but this Muslim guy was seems to be who was wanted me to go and see Shabir Ali seemed to be a very very learned uh, Muslim because he began to ask me questions about the New Testament canon and he specifically asked me about 2 Peter, uh, about the authorship of 2 Peter, and he was basically saying that um, the early church fathers didn't quote 2 Peter and therefore it shouldn't be in the Cana, New Testament Cana. The next issue uh, that I'd like to talk about is the Council of Nicaea. I, I, there was a Muslim uh, on the same day another Muslim, a young man who had a massive debate with me, he, he claimed categorically that the Council of Nicaea decided on um, on the text of scripture, the New Testament that there were over 400 documents uh, that were considered at the Council of Nicaea and we had this massive debate and uh, a number of and I categorically stated he didn't. Now, as some of my people who were listening to the debate, some of my people who were listening to the debate thought I'd got it wrong and. I hadn't got it wrong and so I want to make this clear to any Muslims out there and to atheists out there what the actual facts are concerning the Council of Nicaea. So that's where we're heading today. It's, a, it's, it's pretty technical tonight um, and so I hope that what I have to share um, will be a help to people um, concerning this. now. just drinking my cup of tea so very interesting topic so first of all uh, and I'd like to just talk about uh, Constantine Constantine article that you can uh, read is the authenticity of 2 Peter by Michael J Kruger uh, Michael J Kruger the authenticity authenticity of 2 Peter the journal of Ether of the Evangelical Theological Society published 1999 you can get it on PDF and it's a very very good article now he writes J and D, D. Kelly who was a very authoritative writer but he writes, J. N. D. Kelly in his commentary on 2 Peter confesses that scarcely anyone nowadays doubts that 2 Peter is pseudo-anonymous. Indeed, from the very start, this epistle has a difficult journey. It was received into the New, Te New Testament canon with hesitation, considered second-class scripture by Luther, reluctantly accepted by Calvin and rejected by Erasmus.
modern scholars uh, concerning the authorship of 2 Peter. Basically, most modern scholars would say uh, 2 Peter um, is is um, is not actually written by the Apostle Peter. And basically, the arguments go like this. Basically, the scholarly arguments go, uh, number one, um, the early church fathers didn't quote or didn't see uh, 2 Peter as authoritative. That's the first argument. Second argument is um, internal. If you look at the Greek of 2 Peter, it's not the same kind of Greek. It's not as good as Greek as 1 Peter. So it's obviously 2 Peter was not written by the Apostle Peter. And there is language such as in 2 Peter, it mentions, it quotes Jude, and therefore is obviously coming after Jude. This is the arguments that the scholars use. It also says he's eyewitnesses, is an eyewitness, and that obviously shows that he wasn't an eyewitness. These are kind of the scholarly arguments that go to say that 2 Peter is not uh, actually uh, written by the Apostle Peter and not, um, not from the first century, early first century. So how do we argue against this. Well, it's for, first of all, it's important that if, if the vast majority of modern scholars think on a particular topic, then, and, and, and there's a consensus, then on one hand, we have to take that very seriously. We're not anti-intellectual, and if modern scholars take a particular position and they're all agreed upon it, then we take that seriously, but it's an argument from authority if it's not actually rooted in evidence. And there is a lot of evidence to say that the majority of modern scholars are incorrect. And I want to show you some of that evidence to show you that even though there is a consensus on it by modern scholars as evangelical Christians and as apologists and people who are debating Muslims and atheists, uh, we can give solid evidence is why 2 Peter should be in the New Testament and I'm going to give you some of those solid evidences now. So hitting on the, he on the head the argument that the early church fathers didn't actually quote 2 Peter. Um, actually Sorry about this. Okay. Okay. So, um, 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 4 is quoted by Clement of Alexandria in the Stromata book 7. Uh, 2 Peter 1 4 is quoted by Hippolytus, Refutation of Heresies, 2 Peter 1.4 is mentioned by Novation concerning the Trinity, 2 Peter 1.11 is mentioned by Clement of Alexandria, and 2 Peter 1.20 is mentioned by Tertullian on the April of Woman, Book 2. Uh, we'll go into some more quotations. Peter seriously and what I've just showed you is absolutely categorically that's not true uh, by just the quotations that I've given you and my computer always has a bad connection when I'm doing Google Hangouts this is quite frustrating okay uh, 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 1 is mentioned by Tertullian and uh, 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 1 is meant to me mentioned by uh, Hippolytus, uh, 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 1 
by Lactanius in Divine Institutes, Book 4. Um, 2 Peter 2 5 is mentioned in 1 Clement. Uh, 2 Peter 2 5 is mentioned by Tertullian, Answers to the Jews. 2 Peter 2 5 at 1 Clement. 2 Peter 2 6, Tertullian. 2 Peter 2 9, 2 Clement. 2 Peter 2 11, Cyprian Treatise in the book 12, three books of testimonies, 2 Peter 2.16, Cyprian Treatise of the Exhortations to Martyrdom addressed to Fortunatus. Uh, and you get the picture, we'll just do the next chapter in 2 Peter. So what I'm giving you here is cutting edge scholarship research that completely refutes uh, the consensus in modern scholarship today. And basically all you have to do is just do your own primary research. In 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 3 it's mentioned by 1 Clement. Um, 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 3 is mentioned by uh, Hippolytus. Uh, 2 Peter 3 5 and this is very significant is mentioned by Shepherd of Hermes and 2 Peter 3.3 3 is mentioned by 1 Clement. Now it's very significant that 2 Peter is mentioned by 1 Clement because that's an early first set that Numbers, 2 Peter 3.8 Dialogue of Justin, 2 Peter 3.8 uh, 2 Peter 3.8, Irenaeus against heresies, this is significant. Uh, 2 Peter 3.9, mentioned by Ignatius. And uh, so there we are, we could go on. Uh, and Clement of Alexandria, I think it is, uh, also wrote a commentary on 2 Peter. So what this all tells you is you've just witnessed the demolition of modern scholarship when they say that 2 Peter is not mentioned by the early church fathers because the information that I've just given you there utterly demolishes it. If you want the uh, references to that, uh, if you go to early church Christian writings, E. Catina, E. Catina, early Christian writings dot com, E. E. Catina, go to, go to E. Catina, and there you have a whole list of all the quotations the early church fathers did of the New Testament. Then go down to 2 Peter and click on each chapter and you'll get the references. Okay? So, on that basis, when a Muslim scholar or when uh, an atheist scholar or when uh, somebody says that 2 Peter wasn't in the canon, uh, till the 4th century that it wasn't taken seriously. Yeah, okay, uh, it wasn't in the canon till the 4th century. We, we don't disagree with that. But when they say that it wasn't taken seriously as scripture or seen as uh, part of the word of God, um, this is just completely not true because we've just seen in the early church fathers there and some very significant early church fathers, very, very significant, Um, the next thing that I like to, that that alone just ends all controversy basically as far as I'm concerned um, now one of the things that the Muslim guy mentioned that I was talking to in my city and what people will bring out is they will say well Origen uh, had doubts about 2 Peter now back to Kruger um, on page 5 of his essay, a wonderful scholarly essay by a conservative evangelical scholar says uh, 2 Peter in the early church origin 182 to 251 is the first to cite 2 Peter by name at the beginning of the 3rd century and thus often finds himself as the pitiful, pivotal church father in discussions of the epistles authenticity
the explicit citation is hardly the only data that proves to be relevant. Despite the fact that Origen recognises that some had doubts about the epistle, he himself certainly did not. He quoted the epistle six times and clearly regarded it as scripture. It is evident that he considers two Peter as in, an equal in authority with one Peter by saying that even Peter blows on the twin trumpets of his own epistles. It seems quite difficult to believe that an epistle that Origen treated in such a manner could have been just recently composed in, it, in its own day. Indeed, the fact that he quotes it so thoroughly as scripture in his writings suggests that it may have been accepted widely as cano canonical by this time. Interestingly, Origen fails to indicate the reason for the doubt some of his contemporaries maintained. Nor did he discuss their ex extent or location. It seems fair, th fair, therefore, to suggest that Origen did not deem these doubts to be of any serious nature, or at least not enough to question, to Peter's scriptural status. In addition, considering the fact that Origen was one of the sharpest literary critics in the ancient world, his silence on two Peter's literary style seems quite conspicuous. Perhaps he was not persuaded that the epistles were fundamentally all that different. In the light of these and aftermentioned considerations, the fact that Origen is the first to cite two Peter by name in Norway argues conclusively against two Peter's authenticity. So that's quite remarkable because the Muslim guy who I was debating uh, earlier on this week was saying that Origen proves that um, 2 Peter was not authentic and Kruger's just done a masterful job to show that that's just completely nonsense. Eusebius in 265 to 339, uh, Kruger goes on to say, makes it clear, quote, makes it clear that the majority of the church accepted the epistle as authentic, although he himself had certain reservations about it. He mentions that his doubts stem from the fact that the writers he respected did not affirm its canacity, and that it was not to his acknowledge quote to his knowledge quoted by the ancient presbyters. But it is interesting to note that despite his reservations, he lists to Peter along James Jude two and John three as in quotes the disputed books which nevertheless are known to most. So even Eusebius does not place to Peter in with the spurious writings such as the Apocalypse of Peter. Church fathers subsequent to Oregon, such as Origen, such as Jerome, Athanasius, Gregory of Nicaea and Augustine all, all acknowledge the canonicity of 2 Peter. Even though Jerome was a main proponent of 2 Peter's authenticity, he recognised the significant stylistic divergences with 1 Peter. He sought to account for his diversions by suggesting that Peter used a different uh, amanuensis. After Jerome's time, there were no further doubts concerning two Peter's place in the New Testament canon. As far as can canonical lists are concerned, we find two Peter absent from the Moratorium Fragment, 180 AD, one of the earliest extant lists in church history. Although this may seem to be substantial in evidence against the epistles, authenticity. It's important to note that 1 Peter, James and Hebrew were also not included. Furthermore, although this list omits 2 Peter, by no means does it regard it as spurious. Silence does not equal rejection. 2 Peter was recognized as fully can canonical canons of Laodicea and by the time of the church councils of Hippo and Carthage in the 4th century. It's significant that the later church cantos were the very ones that rejected the letters of Barnabas and Clement of Rome, which were both very well-respected writings in the early church and often used alongside scripture, indicating that these church councils exhibited careful analysis of all documents and rejected all they considered as sub-apostolic. To Peter's full acceptance into the canon by the church, of the church by the 4th century is confirmed by its appearance in various early manuscripts of the New Testament. The Baudemar Papyrus, designated P72, is a papyrus dating to the 3rd century and contains the oldest copies of 1 and 2 Peter. In addition, to 2 Peter finds a firm canonical home with its appearance in some of the most important textual discoveries, discoveries Codex Satiat, 
Sinaiticus, 4th century Codex, Vaticanus, 4th century, and Codex Alexandrius, 5th century. In our quest to determine the authenticity of 2 Peter, we cannot overlook the fact that 2 Peter, despite the reservations of some, was finally and fully accepted by the Church as canonical in every respect. The fact that 2 Peter, 2 Peter faced such resistance, resistance coupled with the incessant competition of pseudo-Petrine literature and still prevailed, proves to be worthy of serious consider, consideration. It is so easy to dismiss the conclusion of Origen, Cyril of Jerusalem, Gregory of Nanzantium, Epithanius and Athanasius, Augustine, Rufinus, Jerome, the Church Councils of Laodicea, Hippo and Carthage. Thus, if the epistle of 2 Peter held such a firm position in the 4th century canon, then perhaps the burden and the proof should fall on those who say it does not belong there. Maybe the question then is not what further evidence is there for 2 P Peter, Peter's canonicity, but what reasons are there to put 2 Peter out of the canon considering its authenticity, authentic, authentication by the consensus of the 4th century church? It is at that question we now turn. So this is a very substantial, end of quote, this is a very, very substantial article. And I've read a few articles today uh, for those against the position and those for it. Um, and uh, I think that Kruger has given some powerful arguments against uh, the modern consensus on 2 Peter there. Um, now, I think we basically, Kruger and I, have basically demolished uh, the modern consensus, I think, utterly demolished it, as far as I'm concerned. Um, on the outer, uh, on the information and evidence outside in the historical realm, um, we've used early church father quotations, we've, I've, we've looked at what Kruger has said, and I think that's enough information for you to be equipped as you go and read his article. And as you go and check those quotations to to give you a substantial uh, evidences to 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 go against any atheist or Muslim who says that two Peter shouldn't be in the canon for whatever reason. But then we've got to look at internal writing, the internal work of two Peter. So basically, the argument goes: uh, the Greek in two Peter is not the same as the Greek in one. Peter. Uh, the Greek seems to be much more classically orientated or better constructed in 1 Peter than it is in 2 Peter. Um, I think that the stylistic differences are overstated because the two letters have two different um, purposes. Letter number one is um, covering subjects um, such as husbands love your wives, um, submission to the authority, um, being stewards of God's grace, being shepherds of God's flock, etc. 2 Peter is specifically deeply concerned about heresies and heretical teachers, and so there's much more of a, a graver concern on this issue. Uh, other objections to 2 Peter that have come out is when 2 Peter um, says Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. So because it says Peter, um, it's therefore um, a pseudo-writer uh, claiming to be Peter. But if we look at 1 Peter, it says Peter. In verse 1, verse 1, it says Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now, if you were going to pretend to be the Apostle Peter. The next letter that you would write, if you were going to pretend to be Peter and you were starting your letter, you would write Peter. Just like 1 Peter here. 1 Peter in verse chapter 1, verse 1, we read, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. But in 2 Peter we read, Simon, Peter, a servant, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now if you were going to 
write a letter to N to beat Peter, you would just put Peter, trying to copy the first letter. So the fact that the writer says Simon Peter shows you that it's not Sudoi, this is a person who is Peter. And um, otherwise, they would have tried to copy exactly what the first letter said. And the true author of the, of the letter, the Apostle Peter, is adding um, the older rendition of his name, Simon Peter, which, were, which has early historical tradition uh, behind it as well, which gives it more evidence that it's actually written by Peter. The second issue is this two Peter mentions that they are eyewitnesses of the resurrection, that they are eyewitnesses, uh, um, sorry, yeah, eyewitnesses, that they're an eyewitness of the resurrection, that, that they saw the transformation, and this is so-called so seen as uh, being one of these false pretenders of Peter because um, of this kind of saying that they're an eyewitness and that they saw the transfiguration. This doesn't follow because in apocryphal literature when they're talking about visions it's often exuberant and exaggerated. In 2 Peter it is not exuberant and it's not exaggerated. It actually matches very closely to Matthew's account which is very significant. Uh, so it's therefore in the apostolic tradition when it talks about when 2 Peter talks about um, the the transfiguration okay the other issue that scholars would say why 2 Peter is not genuine Peter is because he mentioned of the Apostle Paul's writings and the argument goes that the early church fathers didn't really fully understand that Paul's epistles were scripture till later, and yet 2 Peter's clearly saying that Paul's epistles is scripture. And I, I think that's a weak argument. I, I don't think that follows. Um, the early writer, uh, Peter, obviously can have recognized the authority of the Apostle Paul. In fact, the early church recognized the authority of the Apostle Paul. There was a, a sense of Paul was authoritative, so they would have seen his letters as scripture, and 2 Peter is recognizing that. The fact that the early church fathers, and it's true, yes, it is true, may that they were slow in recognizing Paul's epistles as scripture, does not necessarily follow that the early church, before the early church fathers, that they recognized Paul's epistles as scripture because they did see him as authoritative and so they would have seen his letters as scripture. Um, I'm trying to think of any other objection. The other main objection of modern scholars against to Peter is um, what is it now? It, it, it's the fact that he quotes, it, it seems to be quoting Jude. And so if it's quoting Jude, then it, he must have come after Jude. That's just an assumption. Um, it, could, it could be 2 Peter was before Jude, and Jude is quoted 2 Peter. It doesn't, it's just an assumption to say that Peter is quoting from Jude. Okay. Um, so that's based some of the scholarship on uh, to Peter there. And um, so we'll go to the conclusion of Kruger, and uh, I'll give you a couple of more references on that. And we're going to read to Peter, that because we, we've been a bit academic, and we're just going to read it and just do a little devotional reflection on it. Because I think it's important not just to be academic, but to also be spiritual. So let's just listen read uh, Kruger. Uh, so I've touched upon the main scholarly issues that I've addressed is the early church fathers. The internal consistence of the letter, I think if you want to get to grips with that more detail, read Kruger's uh, essay. Okay. As we make, in conclusion, quote, Kruger says, as we make some concluding observations, allow me to mention particular weak 
that I have observed in the case against 2Peter. If 2Peter is pseudo-anonymous work, then it fails to offer any adequate reason to tear. In other words, the pseudo-writers lack some motive. In most Christian pseudopigrapha, it is clear that the writing, sought, the writing sought to promote a view which would not be accepted otherwise by the Christian church. The Gospel of Peter, for example, was written to promote a docetic Christology and even seems to have an anti-Semitic agenda. The Gospel of Thomas has a clear Gnostic worldview to promote. The Apocalypse of Peter was designed to add to our knowledge about the future life. The pseudo Epigraphic literature is normally connected to heretical groups. Orthodox groups had no need for the device because their teaching was consistent with the church already, and thus they would have no motive to promote it falsely on the name of an apostle. Indeed, there is nothing found in 2 Peter that could not have been said by any other New Testament writer. So for what polemical purpose was 2 Peter written? There seems to be no convincing answer to that question. I think that question alone by Kruger utterly demolishes modern scholarship when it says that two Peter shouldn't be in the canon. Because all the apocryph apocryphal literature has an agenda. So what did two Peter have as an agenda? It should have something significant to put on the table for its pseudo writing agenda and it doesn't it's very much matches apostolic teaching so anyhow that's just me there back to Kruger so for what polemical purpose was 2 Peter written there seems to be no convincing answer to this question it has no evident heterodoxical agenda bears no clear resemblance to any other pseudo petrine literature and exhibits no reference to any of the second century doctrinal controversies. Of course, the contents are perfectly un understandable if Peter was the source. Thus, we have seen in this paper the three main problems that leads to led scholars to question the authenticity of 2 Peter. First, we dealt with the problems from 2 Peter's lack of external attestation. Although the support for 2 Peter is significant weaker, than other canon canonical books, there is more evidence of an early date than most are willing to acknowledge. The fact that the early church finally accepted 2 Peter as fully can canonical ought to add some degree of weight in favour of its authenticity. Secondly, we pursued the various stylistic literary arguments against the epistle, and he goes into it much more detail than I just went into it. I just skinned the surface, but he goes into it in much more intricate detail. Third, we discussed the various historical and doctrinal inconsistencies. I didn't cover doctrinal inconsistencies because um, you can go into the le into this essay uh, and get into that in more detail. Although one may not agree with every argument that seems to support the authorial claims of 2 Peter, one certainly must conclude that the case for 2 Peter's pseudonymity is somewhat tendentious and incomplete. Uh, so that's a wonderful article um, by a very competent scholar by Michael J. Kruger, The Authenticity of 2 Peter in the Journal of Evangelical Theological Society. Now if you want another academic article, um, you can get it on bible.org, bible.org, 2 Peter by Daniel B. Wallace. Daniel B. Wallace is an eminent New Testament textual critic. Daniel B. Wallace, um, Second Peter, uh, Bible.org. And he specifically is strong on internal critique of 2 Peter and showing how modern scholars have missed some of the important facets to show that 2 Peter is actually should be in the canon and is written by the Apostle Peter and he being a textual critic he goes into the internal evidences and it's a very competent piece of work uh, it's very clear to read Daniel B Wallace uh, second Peter Bible dot org 
Now, that's the kind of academic stuff that we've looked at, basically. Um, now, I think we're just going to look at some popular material by John MacArthur. We're going to read his introduction outlines, and then uh, we're going to read the actual chapter by chapter and, and maybe just think about what this all means for us. So basically what what I wanted to do really is just to give you a bit of scholarship on why two Peter should be in the canon. So if you ever meet a Muslim or an atheist and they, they start talking about two Peter or mention it, you've got some some things to, to go on. So have a look at the two articles, one by Wallace and Kruger. Um, just type in their names and the topic and it should come up, okay? Okay. So that's the academic stuff. Now we're just going to have a 15, 20 minutes devotional on 2 Peter. We'll, we'll read John MacArthur's study notes and uh, I'm just going to say prayers. we look at that. Then we're going to go into a, a bit more academia with Constantine and Nicaea. All right? That's what we're going to do next, okay? Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for your goodness and love today. And Lord, we give you the praise and the glory and the honor. And Father, I just pray that you bless the reading of your word today. And I pray that we'd be encouraged as we look at your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. John MacArthur writes, The clear claim to authorship in one Peter, 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 1 by the Apostle Peter gives the epistle its title to distinguish it from Peter's first epistle. It was given the Greek title Peter or B or 2 Peter. Author and date. The author of 2 Peter is the Apostle Peter. He makes that claim in 2 Peter 3 1. He refers to his first letter in 1 Peter verse 4 in 2 Peter 1 verse 4 14 he refers to the Lord's prediction of his death or, um, concerning John chapter 21 verse 18 to 19 and in 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 16 18 he claims to have been at, at the transfiguration Matthew 17 1 8 to 2 Peter by name until origin near the beginning of the 3rd century. The ancient church historian Eusebius only included 2 Peter in the, his list of disputed books along with James and Jude, 2 John and 3 John. Even the leading reformers only hesitatingly accepted it. The question about differences in Greek style between the two letters have been satisfactorily answered. Peter wrote that he used an uh, amanuensis Silvanus in 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 5 and 12 chapter 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 12 in 2 Peter Peter either used a different amanuensis or wrote the letter by himself the difference in vocabulary between the two letters can be explained by the differences in themes first Peter was written to help suffering Christians second Peter was written to expose false teachers on the other hand, there are remarkable similarities in the vocabulary of the two books. The salutation, grace and peace be multiplied to you is essentially the same in each book. The Greek words rendered precious, virtue, putting off and eyewitness in 2 Peter are used in both letters. Certain rather unusual words found in 2 Peter are also found in Peter's speeches in the Acts of the Apostles. These include obtained or was allotted. Uh, in 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 1, Acts chapter 1 verse 17. Uh, godliness of piety in 2 Peter 1 3, 6 and 7, 3 11, and Acts 3 12. The wages or gained or reward of wickedness or unrighteousness in 2 Peter 2 13, 
and 15 to Acts chapter 1 verse 18. Both letters also refer to the same Old Testament event, 2 Peter chapter Two letters almost unique to weave by, by written by Paul. The difference in themes also explains certain emphasis, such as why one letter teaches that second coming is near, and one deals with its delay. Background and setting. Since the time and writing and sending of this first letter, Peter had become increasingly concerned about false teachers who were infiltrating the churches in Asia Minor. Though these false teachers had already caused trouble, Peter expected that their heretical doctrines and immoral lifestyles would result in more damage in the future. Thus Peter, in almost last will and testament, wrote to warn the beloved believers in Christ about the doctrinal dangers they were facing. Peter does not explicitly say where he was, tradition by being crucified upside down. Paul says nothing in the salutation about the recipients of this letter, but according to 2 Peter 3 1, Peter was writing another epistle to the same people to whom he wrote 1 Peter. In his first letter he spelled out that he was writing to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia and Bithynia. These provinces were located in the area of Asia Minor, which is in modern Turkey. The Christians to whom Peter wrote most, most mostly Gentiles. Historical and theological themes. Second Peter was written for the purpose of expo exposing, thwarting, and defeating the invasion of false teachers into the church. Peter intended to instruct Christians in how to defend themselves against the false teachers and the deceptive lies. This book is most graphic and penetrating expose of false teachers in scripture comparably only to Jude. The description of the false teachers is somewhat generic. Gen generic. Peter does not ad identify some specific false religion or cult or system of teaching and general characterization of false teachers he informs that they teach destructive heresies. They deny Christ and twist the scriptures. So that's uh, John MacArthur's notes, introductory notes to 2 Peter. So we're going to read um, chapter 1 and then stop, have a few thoughts, meditations, and then we'll read chapter 2 and then meditate and then chapter 3. Okay? Okay. So. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has granted unto all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, excuse me, so that through you through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. For this very reason, make every effort to supplant to your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these
qualities you will never fall. For in this way there will be richly provided for you an inheritance in the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. Therefore I intend always to remind you of these qualities, though you know them and are established in the truth, and that you have. I think it right, as long as I am in this body, to stir you up by way of reminder, since I know that putting off of my body will be soon as our Lord Jesus Christ may clear to me, and I will make every effort so that after my departure you may be able at any time to recall these things. But we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitness of his majesty, for when he received honour and glory from God the Father, the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain, and we have something more sure of the prophetic word to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. No prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So that's the first chapter. Um, my own thoughts on this first chapter, what are they? Well, Um, my own thoughts, first of all, I think, is, is uh, where he talks about, in verse 4, by which he has granted to us the precious and very great promises so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature. So when we're born again, it's the divine nature, the Holy Spirit comes and dwells in us. And I think that's very, very profound to, to think about that. That God's nature, the Holy Spirit, comes to dwell in our lives, in our hearts. It makes you realize that we should be careful in what we say, who we, or what we look at, that God's Holy Spirit dwells in our hearts. We're partakers of the divine nature. Then he says, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. So the world is corrupt, according to Peter. The world is corrupt. For this very reason, make every effort to supplant your faith with virtue. So it kind of comes across as if, you're like a, a Christian is like a salmon swimming upstream. For this very reason, make every effort to supplant your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control. So there's this desire as a Christian to, to walk in a godly life based on knowledge, and knowledge with self-control. So we, as we learn knowledge, we control ourselves steadfastness we got to be faithful not fickle and steadfastness with godliness it bears fruit into goodness and godliness with brotherly affection there's got to be the feeling and rep desire of love and brotherly affection with love for if these qualities are yours and are increasing they keep you from being in effective or in fruitful knowledge of our lord jesus christ so the the picture is a steady moving forward the christian should be steadily moving forward and it comes down to at the beginning there in verse 5 for this very reason make every effort to supplant your faith with virtue so when you have faith in Christ you should have a desire to be virtuous that should increase your desire to have knowledge when you have knowledge you gain self-control when you have self-control you become steadfast when you're steadfast you become godly when you become godly you begin to have a, a heart of love and when you have a heart of love you begin to bear fruit. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, says Peter, they keep you from being ineffective 
are unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from this one was sins. So if we're falling in a sin, if we're if we're backsliding, we're forgetting these important things. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to make your calling and election sure. If you practice these qualities, you will never fall. If we practice these qualities, if we practice these qualities, we will never fall. So these qualities are something that daily, hourly, we are to think about. We're to think about hourly, about seeking virtue. We are to be thinking, thinking hourly about gaining knowledge, about self-control, about being steadfast, about being godly, about loving. And if we do this, we will never fall. He goes on, for in this way there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. And here it says, uh, and he said it before, that our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, he is a Saviour. He's come to save us, and he is our Lord. Therefore I tend always, says Peter, to remind you of these qualities, though you know them and are established in the truth that you have, I think it right, as long as I am in the body, to stir you up by way of reminder. So they knew the truth. They knew what was right. They knew what was biblical. But yet he still teaches them again and reminds them again. Since I know that putting off my body will be soon, so our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me, and I will make every effort so that my departure you may be able at a time to recall these things. So this is the epistle of Peter, and it's Peter who is ready for martyrdom. He was about to die, remember, and he was crucified crucified upside down and his legacy to you before he was crucified is to say keep your mind fixed on virtue on knowledge on godliness on being steadfast on wanting to be a disciple of Jesus Christ and he wants us to be remembering these things to rem remember remember these things and we can forget these things so easily then he goes for we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we may know to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty this is a a man who knew Jesus Christ and saw Jesus Christ and saw the majesty of Christ or when he received honor and glory from God the Father, the voice was born to him by majestic glory. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. And we have something more sure, the prophetic word, to which you will do well to pay attention, as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawn and the morning star rises in your hearts. So he's saying, look, I saw at the Mount of Configuration, of, of Transfiguration, I saw, I saw him and the glory of God descend on him. And this has the authentic ring of Peter. It has the authentic ring of an apostle. And he saw Jesus. And he saw his majesty in glory. It reminds me of Moses when he went up the mountain and he got the Ten Commandments and he came down and his face was shining with the glory of God. And Peter was in the mountain with Jesus and he saw the glory of God descend upon Jesus. And he testifies to it. And he knows what's the difference between the myth and and a fact, he knows that when he is saying that he has seen this, that it is a fact, not just a myth. This is fact, he saw it, he says. But then he says a more sure word, the prophetic word, the word of God, 
the word of the Old Testament. How many times has the Old Testament been attacked? You know, a lot of atheists will tell you that the Old Testament has slavery in it. Did you know that the word slave Go back to its more ancient usage and translation. That's just an aside, by the way. If you want more understanding of what I just said, go to um, Peter Williams uh, on the Old Testament YouTube. Just type in uh, the morality of the Old Testament, Peter Williams, Dr. Peter Williams, and he will give you a master class in the Hebrew word for slave. Let's go to 2 Peter, chapter 2. Well, first, let's just finish on verse 29 of that chapter, chapter 1. Knowing, verse 20, knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever produced. Produced by the will of men, but men from God as they were carried along by the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit of God was behind the prophets. Prophets were men who God breathed into by the Holy Spirit. 2 Peter chapter 2. False prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you who will severely bring destructive heresies even denying the master who bought them bringing upon themselves swift destruction and many will follow their sensuality sensuality and because of them the way of truth will be blasphemed and in their greed they will exploit you with false words the condemnation from long ago is not idle and their destruction is not asleep for if God did not spur angels when they sinned but cast them into hell and committed the chains of a gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment if he did not spur the ancient world but preserved Noah a herald of righteousness with seven others when he brought a, brought a flood upon the world of ungodly if by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes to condemn the extinction making them an example what is going to happen to the ungodly and if he rescued righteous lot greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked for as that righteous man lived among them day after day he was tormented his righteous soul over the lawless deeds that he saw and heard and the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment and especially those who indulge in the lust of divining passion and despise authority bold and willful they do not trample as they blaspheme they blaspheme the glorious one Wherein angels, though from empire, do not pronounce a blasphemous judgment against the, them before the Lord, but these, like irrational animals, creatures of instinct born to be caught and destroyed, blaspheming about matters of which they are ignorant, will also be destroyed in their destruction. Suffering wrong as the wages for their wrongdoing, they count it pleasure to revel, revel, in, revel in the daytime. They are blots and blemishes, re revealing in their deceptions. While they feast with you, they have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. They entice unsteady souls. They have hearts trained in greed, accursed children, forsaken the right way. They have gone astray. They have followed the way of Balaam, the son of Bor, who loved gain from wrongdoing, but was rebuked for his own transgression. A speechless donkey spoke with with human voice and respect the prophet's madness. These are waterless springs and mist driven by a storm. From them the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved. The speaking loud boasts of folly, the enticed by sensual passion of the flesh, those who are barely escaping from those who live in error, they promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption, for whatever overcomes a person to that he is enslaved. For even after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, they are 
again entangled in them and overcome. The last state has become worse for them than the first, for it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. What the true proverb says has happened to them. The dog returns to its own vomit. The sow, after washing herself, returns to wallow in there. What I find interesting there is how doctrinal divergence doctrinal divergence goes hand in hand with sexual immorality where there is doctrinal divergence against apostolic teaching and against the biblical truth there will be sexual promiscuousness and we see that today the evangelical church to my mind is a church that is in a crisis we are in a crisis make no bones about it the evangelical church is in a crisis whether it be the charismatic the Calvinist the reformed conservative evangelical there is a massive crisis and the crisis is everywhere the crisis is in the mainstream churches whether it be Catholic whether it be Anglican, whether it be Methodist, whether it be whatever denomination you're in, there is a crisis. There's a crisis in the denial of key doctrines. Paul, uh, Peter says, but false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them bringing upon themselves swift destruction the last 10 the last 20 years in the church there has been a, a ferment of theological revolution that I think that has not gone that has not been vigorously challenged enough that has not gone vigorously refuted enough there has not been the passion there has not been the defense of the Christian faith as there should have been the defense has been woefully inadequate and therefore it's got worse and worse and worse and confusion abounds on every side and then a hardness sets in on those who take sides. So what am I referring to? Well, 15 years ago we had the openness of God theology by Clark Pinnock, who said that God doesn't know the future, that conservative Christian theology about God came from Greek philosophy, the early church fathers used Greek philosophy. This spread amongst evangelicals. While that was happening, there was an undermining of key doctrines such as the atonement. We had evangelical writers, thinkers. In the UK, Steve Chalk. In America, we have Rob Bell. And they all questioned the atonement. They all said, did Jesus really, was he really punished for our sin? We have people like David Platt, who stood against this. Um, we had the Evangelical Alliance in the UK organizing a meeting. But to be honest, the fact that we had evangelical leaders, Easy, the modern church is that it would even countenance such thinking that it would even debate such thinking shows you the madness of the times and then we've had the emergent church come and on top of this we've had 
charismatic delusions upon delusions where we've had crazy preachers get up on pulpits and start laughing like drunken donkeys who are on cannabis laughing their heads off and calling this being baptized in the Holy Spirit when it was blasphemy it was a it was a disgrace and people like Todd Bentley whacking people over the head and saying that this is the Holy Ghost and then he goes and commits adultery and this was all nonsense where we've had these kind of crazy health and wealth preachers of the gospel who say word false doctrine is sexual immorality is and that's what we see in 2 Peter and so all this false doctrine all this confusion in the evangelical church and and the denominations has then allowed people to come in with their sexual immorality and so we've had the gay uh, lobby come in and has infected every denomination and now is come has come in and is coming strongly in the evangelical church basically it says we are people of love we should be loving to gay people and basically we should be acceptance of them and so now we're seeing that we have ministers that are ordained in the church of england that are gay and nobody really raises an eyebrow but if the Apostle Peter was here he would say but false prophets also arose among the people just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies even denying the master that bought them bringing upon themselves swift destruction that's the doctrine and many will follow their sensuality that's the immorality because of them the way of truth will be blasphemed And so, Christian morality is turned on its head. And what I find shocking in this modern Christian world and evangelical world, what I find shocking amongst the preachers is there is no... I'm not I'm not a person I'm not a person who who wants controversy theological controversy I'm a person who tries to look for the good in every Christian denomination or church that believes the fundamentals of the Christian faith But I do think there is a crisis in the church today. And I do think that there are, we, we lack the leadership. I know that a friend of mine likes John MacArthur and John MacArthur has stood up against uh, some charismatic, uh, um, charismatic um, excess, whatever. But what I'm on about, the doctrinal confusion is much bigger than that. The, it, it's much, much bigger than that. The Calvinistic movement basically is a joke. The Calvinistic movement is not even in the running. The Calvinistic movement is not known at all amongst evangelicals as a, a loving movement. Is virtually not known amongst evangelicals. We do not associate love with the Calvinist. Let's be honest. I'm from that area of thinking.
there's doctrinal confusion there's a crisis among the evangelicals and it's much much deeper much much deeper than we all realize I'm not against the church I go to church I go to two churches I go and have a Bible study I sit under a man an elderly man who teaches the Bible and it is wonderful and I go to a large church where there is a, a well-respected minister and the well-respected evangelical church but I think there is a crisis and it's bigger It says here the false prophets also arose among the people just as there will be false teachers among you who will recently who will secretly bring in destructive heresies secretly did you know there has been a secret a secret a secret impregnation of the church did you know that I'll prove it to you beyond the shadow of a doubt. Investigate, go and investigate all the theological seminaries around the world. Go and investigate every single theological seminary around the world. Okay? Just go, spend an evening and go and look into all the theological seminaries that are around in the world. And even the evangelical one. And then when you've investigated them, ask the question, are the lecturers, are the scholars, do they believe in the full inspiration of the Bible? Do they believe in the fundamentals of the Bible? And what you will find to your shock and to your amazement is many of the evangelical seminaries have had scholars who have been teaching for years and they don't believe the fundamentals. They don't believe in inerrancy that the Bible is fully inspired. They don't believe in some of the fundamentals that you and I believe in. And they have taught students, thousands of them, their new ideas. And these students have gone into, into churches and they teach the new ideas. And we are feeling today the impact of these seminaries in our, con in our churches around the world today. Because we have many sisters in the church today that are full of philosophy, full of sociology and psychology, full of different ideas that they've got from these seminary professors and they're blind and they're leaders of, and they're leading people down a blind alley and these leaders are not standing up against sin, they're not standing up against modern culture, they are embracing modern culture and they are following what secular culture wants and basically what's going to happen is you're going to see a time in a few years where the mainline denominations and the evangelical churches will be captured by these people it's already happening now and basically if you say as a building, as a congregation, because you have stood against this mainstream, liberal evangelicalism and mainline denominationalism that thinks all the modern secular uh, sexuality is right. So there's coming a day when the church will be utterly taken over by this, these apostate ideas and sadly it's already happening now in Scotland they ha they have gay marriage now and basically 
Scottish ministers will be forced to conduct gay marriages. They're told that they won't have to do it, but they will. They'll be forced. Same for the UK, rest of the UK. Same in America. It's coming a time when the church in the West will have to go underground and it's coming now and I think you have to get ready now. I think you have to get your buildings ready to sell them. You have to get ready to move into house church to go into a building, uh, to go into your homes and have house church groups. Because there's coming a time when your building, if it will not have gay marriage, will be closed down. It doesn't agree with the secular, humanistic, sexual liberation ideas. You don't agree with that. You will be closed. And it's coming soon. And there is a crisis. There is a crisis. And I think a lot of churches today are just they're not aware there is a crisis. They're just fumbling along in their own little ghetto, in their own little world, their own little worship, their own little groups, and they think everything's okay and everything's fine, but it's not. It's not. There's too much confusion. There's dead orthodoxy, rampant hypermysticism, Doctrinal confusion, a sexual promiscuous, are growing, have grown rapidly and are growing rapidly today. And like I said, what I find shocking is we get people, we, we do get people who say, oh, the church is bad, but these are people who are just causing trouble. The people who are nickety and nitpicky. I care about the church, I care about evangelicals, I care about the worldwide church. I'm not nickety and pickety, I'm not trying to find fault, I'm just telling you the facts. The fact of the matter is, the church in the West especially is in a crisis. It's in the biggest crisis that it's ever had in its history. And the sad fact is that very few people actually recognize what's coming to the church in the West. The church in the West is coming, is going to come under great persecution. And, it's, and the persecution will come from a lukewarm church that has capitulated to the secularists. And the secularists will use this lukewarm church to persecute the true church that is on fire for God. And we will be pushed out of our buildings and we will have to move into house churches and go back to where Christianity was in the early church where we were house groups and where we had to secretly meet uh, and, and preach in fear uh, a fear of being arrested that's what's going to happen in the West it's already happening in the East so why do we think in the West that we're going to get away with it why do we think in the West that everything's going to be fine you know the, the days of that have gone you're living in, um, you're living in cloud you're living in a dream world if you think that you can go on as a Christian in your church and it was all it's always been the same and it always will be the same you're in you're, you're deluded because the clouds are coming the fact of the matter is the main light denomination the bishops and the ministers have collapsed and followed them are following the secularist agenda on sexuality they've collapsed there's virtually hardly any opposition against these ideas. The Church of England ministers in the UK should have left the Church of England. The moment they ordained a gay minister, the moment they allowed gay marriage to bless gay marriage, the moment they did that, every minister in the Church of England should have left. 
The fact that you as Church of England ministers have stayed in the church is an indictment upon the church in the West. The church in the West is drunk with the whore of Babylon. She is drunk with the world system. She's in league with the devil because she's not standing up for purity and holiness and her ministers as weak as water and that's a fact and there are a few ministers today who got backbone and are willing to challenge the governments of today and are willing to say it say it as it is to Peter is very relevant is it not chapter 3 all my views on gay beliefs or whatever you can find in Romans chapter 1 that's what I believe chapter 3 This is now the second letter I am writing to you, beloved. In both of them I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandments of the Lord and Saviour through your apostles. Knowing this first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing following their own sinful desires. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. For they deliberately overlooked this fact that the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God. And that by means of the word that then existed was deluged with water and perished, but by the same word the heavens and the earth that now exist are stored up for fire being kept until the day of judgment instruction of the godly. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. For the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and the heavens will pass and with a roar the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed since all these things are thus to be dissolved what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn, but according to his promise, we are waiting for a new heaven, new earth, in which righteousness dwells. Have you noticed something? Tell me honestly as a Christian. Just tell me honestly. When was the last time you had a sermon on the Lord is coming any moment? Hey, just think about it when was the last time you heard a sermon on Jesus is coming any moment notice since all these things are thus be dissolved what sort of people ought you to be in, in lives of holiness and godless waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved and the heavenly bodies will melt and they will burn but according to his promise we are waiting for a new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Years ago, only 20, 30 years, well, no, 30 years ago, the second coming of the Lord was preached on often. Preachers would preach on most sermons. There would be something about Jesus could come at any moment of time. Get ready. You hardly ever hear that now. Why? because people have become worldly and settled in this world and enjoy this world and they're not looking for heaven they don't want to go to heaven they're not thinking of heaven they have become lovers of this world that's why 
preachers have become lovers of this world. They do not see eternity. We do not see eternity anymore. So we don't preach on eternity anymore. To Peter, chapter 3, verse 14. Wherefore, be deaf now to the Muslims when they attack the Apostle Paul, as he does in all his letters when he speaks to them of these matters, there are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do other scriptures. Uh, any Muslim out there who says the Apostle Paul's letters are not scripture, then you need to read this verse. It profoundly annoys me when I hear Muslims say that the Apostle Paul was not authoritative. How dare you, my Muslim friend? How dare you say that? How dare you? attack the Apostle Paul's authority. You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability. But grow in the grace and the... That's what we have to do. Amen. Amen. Okay, we've looked at 2 Peter. I think it was important to get some scriptural reflection there. Let's pray. I'll just check if anyone's listening and uh, if anyone's asked any question. Never know. And then we'll pray for this part. And then we'll go into the Constantine. No questions. Okay. So let me just pray. And then uh, we'll go into some thoughts on Constantine. And I'm just putting a book on a shelf. fact I think what we'll do sometime I have a book here by J. Oswald Sanders and uh, maybe one evening uh, we'll spend um, some time just reading from this book and praying and reading and praying okay and it's called Certainties of Christ Second Come by J. Oswald Sanders. So we'll go one night, we'll have an evening on the Second Coming, reading from that book and scriptures about that. So that will be good to do that. Okay. Okay, let's just close in prayer on this part of our evening. And then we have uh, two little parts where we're going to be looking at Constantine. And we're going to be we're going to be looking at uh, Council of Nicaea because this is cropping up a few times in Manchester during apologetics. So, like I said, I'm not on YouTube at the moment making videos. Uh, this is Google Hangout where any issues I want to bring up or things that I feel like I want to share, I'm going to share. Um, so there we are. So, but I'm not making videos at the moment uh, like I used to. I am much more 95% quieter than I, I used to be. 
And I, like I said, I don't feel particularly called on YouTube to be doing things, but Google Hangout for me is different where I can just come and share my thoughts, maybe give my Bible studies and things. And maybe in the summer I might upload some new lectures and videos, uh, put them on uh, public. But at the moment, I'm just going to do things that that's on my heart, uh, and I'll do it on Google Hangout. So, so let's just uh, pray, cause in prayer concerning two Peter. Lord, Lord, I just confess to you tonight my own failure, and Lord, I, I just pray, forgive me, and. Um, I just think of the woman with the issue of blood, how if she was bleeding, she would have had no life. She would have seen it, been seen as unclean, and yet you show compassion on her. And Lord, I come to you and with my own struggles, my own failures, my own weaknesses. And Lord, we come to you and we ask, Lord, that you forgive us. We ask for your help. And strength. We ask, Lord, that the reality of 2 Peter would be in us, that we would understand the scriptures, that we would understand you, that we would be strong, ready to live for you and your glory. Lord, forgive us our failure and sin, forgive us the weakness of our hearts. Lord, help us to follow you. We're reminded from 2 Peter that this life is just a, a short span. That there is an eternity. It reminds us that we're to fix our eyes on you and to be faithful. I confess, Lord, in my own life, my own weaknesses, my own failures. And we ask, Lord, for your help and strength. We praise you, Lord, and thank you for this day. And I pray for all those who listen to this video, that, that you bless them, that they would know your loving grace, Lord. Amen. Amen. Okay, we're going to just look at uh, two more issues now. Uh, Constantine and Council of Nicaea. Uh, this week I was debating with um, a couple of Muslims and one of them brought up the issue of Nicaea. So I want to talk about Constantine because he's related to the Council of Nicaea. Um, now, my information that I'm getting here is by Dr. Peter Leithart on defending Constantine. So I'll just put him on, you can hear him here. Is a re emergence of sacrificial political order. Uh, the nation state is a sacrificial system. The modern nation state is a sacrificial system. I'm using this rather charged language. Uh, that I'm drawing from a Yale law professor named Paul W. Kahn. I've been reading some of his books recently, particularly a book called uh, Putting Liberalism in Its Place. Let me read a couple of quotations from Kahn just to, I hope, stir up some discussion about this. The modern nation state, he says, has shown itself to be an extremely effective instrument of sacrifice. It's been able to mobilize its, mobilize its population, make sacrifices in order to sustain the state's own historical existence. The immense capacity of the nation state to sacrifice its citizens in war is the great political discovery of the 19th century. That discovery begins with Napoleon's armies inheriting the popular enthusiasm of the revolution. It was further revealed in the American Civil War when democratic armies based on massive mass conscription confront each other for the first time. As the conception of citizenship and political participation broadened, so did the of the reach of military service, the people's state is supported by, a people's, by the people's army, and the army is sent out to offer itself in sacrifice for the maintenance of the state, or to sacrifice other people to kill them for the maintenance of the state. 
Kahn sees this as a relocation of sacrifice in, in the history of the West, a relocation of sacrifice from the earliest, uh, the earliest examples we have of self-sacrifice, or the martyrs of the, of the early church. But he thinks in the modern world what we have is a relocation of a sacrifice, a self-sacrifice in, uh, in the name of Jesus against state power into the modern age where we have a self-sacrifice in favor of state power, a new kind of martyrdom uh, that uh, takes the form of patriotism. This is what Kahn says. The Western state actually exists under the very real threat of Christian martyrdom, a threat to expose the state and its claim to power as nothing at all. That's what the martyrs do. The martyrs win because they show that the, the state's power ends with the power to kill. And if you've got people who just don't mind being killed, the state doesn't. There's the, the state's power is exposed by the martyrs, and it's not. It's not accidental that you have some of the most intense persecution just before Constantine emerges, and the whole system collapses. The martyr wields a power to defeat his murder, which cannot be answered on the field of battle. And then this, I'll leave you with this: the domain of sacrifice shifted in modern politics from that of religious resistance to the state to that of political patriotism. Modern stories of sacrifice are less likely to be of religious resistance to the state than of individuals whose faith in the truth of the state, that is, the popular sovereign, fuels an ultimate resistance against those who make false claims to represent the people. For Americans, Lincoln becomes the great image of the martyr, a politicized Christ. Martin Luther King Jr., too, celebrated, is celebrated not for his adherence to a religious claim to truth in resistance to the state, which is certainly what he thought he was doing, but Martin Luther King Jr. is celebrated instead as a, as a sacrificial patriot in the Lincoln-esque tradition. So that all to say, and I think Kahn is right that this is, uh, there you have the reemergence of, uh, before I had come across Kahn's work, this was part of my argument at the end of defending Constantine, that you have this reemergence of a sacrificial political order in the modern state where you have ultimate claims, absolute claims by the, made by the nation, the nation state, which demands of its citizens their willingness to, to kill themselves and to kill other people. Uh, for the maintenance of that order. Okay, that's a that's a lecture by um, Dr. Peter Leithart called "Defending Constantine." If you want to look at the lecture on YouTube, you can go to Case Wheaton I L. Case Wheaton I L. In fact, I'll put um, a like, and I will. Uh, add it on um, just, uh, sorry about this okay I've put it on uh, my add to playlist uh, apologetics so you can find it on there if you want to go and listen to it it's called Defending Constantine uh, and it's by Dr. Peter Leith Hart. Now, just one or two things about Constantine. Um, he was born um, in 272 uh, AD and died right about 337 AD. Um, there are today, uh, there are a large number of people today who are anti Constantine academics, just to note that. Um, and that was a very important thing to do for him because in the time of the Roman Empire uh, the battle standards were linked to the belief in the gods and that the gods were blessing uh, the army. So when Constantine changed the battle standard to a cross, it was very significant for Constantine and the Roman Empire at that time. Uh, there have been debates whether he was a Christian or not. Um, Dr. Peter Leithart says he was, uh, that he, he was very interested, uh, very sincere in his beliefs although he acknowledges that he in his own book and work didn't pay enough attention to the fact that Constantine was baptized near the end of his life that the fact that he was baptized near the end of the life shows that 
there was this in out distinct if you're baptized you're in the church if you're not baptized you're not in the church so it seems as if Constantine was a believer but he wasn't uh, in the church as it were Constantine as far as Dr. Peter Leithart and this is the main issue uh, was worried about the chism of, schism of the church because for Constantine and his time, they didn't see a distinction between church and state. Mm. The well-being of the church was significant in that it meant that if there was a split within the church, then God would not be happy with them and would not bless the empire. So for Constantine, it was important that there was political unity, uh, that there was unity within the church because of the desire for blessing concerning the empire um, one of the scholars against Peter Leithart is a Yoda what benefit did I get from this lecture uh, about Constantine um, I think uh, the thing that that really came across to me is how Constantine was significant uh, for Western history. That he is very, very important for the development of his the Western history because him adopting Christianity completely changed the West forever. Um, Peter Lehar doesn't go into much detail concerning Council of Nicaea. Uh, I think that I think what I get out of the lecture um, is that there are that Constantine is an area where there is a lot of battleground goes on concerning understanding him and his times, and I think we have to understand this when a Muslim approaches you, or an atheist, or someone different from you. One area of interpretation that will come up is the time of Constantine. So there's a lot of historical revisionists going on by Muslims and atheists trying to read, and popular writers and academics, trying to read Constantine in their own way for their own historical agendas. And I think it was because Council of Nicaea was extremely significant in the development of Christian doctrine. So whoever controls the interpretation and understanding of Constantine also controls the interpretation of how the church developed its doctrine. So what I would encourage you to do is listen to this lecture by Dr. Peter Leithart, uh, but also start to read and do your own research on Constantine, because it would be helpful as background reading for when you ever anyone brings up the Council of Nicaea that you can be able to answer in a very clear way about their questions okay okay now we're going to look at the Council of Nicaea um, this writer says uh, it's on Tertullian.org there seems to be a number of legends about the first Council of Nicaea 325 AD in circulation on the internet as fact. Some people seem to think that the Council, which was first the Council of the Bishops of the Christian Church, either invented the New Testament or edited it to remove this to reincarnation or whatever, or bunch large numbers of heretical works or whatever. These are in error, a problem, and provide the links to all the ancient source material in order to allow everyone to check the truth themselves. So you can get this on uh, the Council of Nicaea and the Bible on www.tertullian.org all right www.tertullian.org the Council of Nicaea and the Bible here's one example of a very bad myth that is propounded on the internet here's an example a bad example quote in tracing the origin of the Bible, one is led to AD 325, when Constantine the Great called the First Council of Nicaea, composed of 300 religious leaders, three centuries after Jesus lived. This council was given the task of separating divinely inspired writings from those 
was of questionable origin. The actual compilation of the Bible was an incredibly complicated project that involved churchmen of many varying beliefs in an atmosphere of dissension, jealousy, intolerance, and persecution and bigotry. At this time, the question of the divinity of Jesus had split the church in two factions. Constantine offered to make the little-known Christian sect the official state religion if the Christians would settle their differences. Apparently, he didn't particularly care what they believed in as long as they agreed upon a belief. By compiling a book of sacred writings, Constantine thought that the book would give authority to the new church. So that is a very, very bad understanding it not only bad, it's misleading concerning the Council of Nicaea. Now this is rife. This is totally rife. Okay, this is absolutely rife everywhere. So we need to hit it on the head. So what are the facts? This uh, legend also appears in the Da Vinci Code. You can get documents issued by the council on www.newadvent.org fathers. The ancient accounts of the council, I admit that I was a little stumped as to what these might be, however I searched the internet. I also went through uh, questions, patriology, looking for any references and drew up a table of references from that. So this is what the researcher found. Uh, this is in the newadvent.org. The adhesion to the creed was general and enthusiastic. All the bishops, say five, declared themselves ready to subscribe to this formula and convinced that it contained the ancient faith of the apostolic church. The opponents soon were reduced to two. Thenus of Micah and Secundus of Plotolemes, who were exiled and atomized. Arius and his writings were also branded with anathema. His boots were cast into the fire and he was exiled by... Uh, Illyria, but the accounts of Eusebius, Socrates, and Suzerman, uh, Theodoret, and Rufinus may be considered as very important sources for historical information, as well as some data preserved by St. Athanasius and a history of the Council of Nicaea, written in the 5th century by Galesius of uh, Cyzicus. And so you have uh, Theodorus, Historia Ecclesia, Book 1, Chapter 6 to 13. This mentions that the definition of Nicaea, Nicaea were drawn up with reference to Scripture and the arguments about whether phrase X or Y was or was not in Scripture informed with the basis of much of the argument. Socrates, Historia Ecclesia, Book 1, verse, Chapter 8. This mentions that Constantine exiled Arius and some of his supporters for refusing to submit to the decisions of the council. It also quotes a letter by Constantine ordering the destruction of all works composed by Arius on pain of death to any found holding them and referring to a similar pa past order regarding the works of Porphyria. Suzerman Historia Ecclesia, Book 1, Chapter 21. This describes the results of the council. Chapter 17 onwards describes the council. Constantine writes to all the cities ordering the destruction of the works of Arius and his followers and the penalty of death for any who refused to destroy them. And we could go on, Eusebius, Athanasius, Refunius and others all quote about the doctrinal issue of um, Arius and trying to tackle his teaching about what's just God. There is one reference by Jerome on Judith uh, where he states that the uh, the Nicene Council uh, believed that Ju Ju Judas was Judith was scripture. Um, so he's saying that the Nicene Council decided that this was scripture. But it doesn't say anything about there was a list compiled doesn't say how many books it doesn't say anything it just says one book Judith uh, was accepted as scripture whether that is um, and that's all the reference we have so basically all the evidence shows basically there was that we have so far shows that there was no massive list of uh, books that the council just 
decided to be scripture. Um, the only reference that we have is uh, Jerome, which is probably the reason why this myth uh, developed. And then there have been fictional books that have come about, like the Da Vinci Code, that have published this myth. But the evidence is basically nowhere to be found. Uh, so when I met this Muslim who said that the Council of Nicaea decided from 400 books what scripture was, there is absolutely no evidence for this whatsoever. The only little scrap of evidence that you can find is Jerome, and that says nothing about the compilation of a list, it's just about one individual book. That's it, really. You can get all that information on the Council of Nicaea and the Bible, www.tertullian.org. And that's it, folks. We've finished this evening, and I uh, hope that's been out to you. And um, try and catch me maybe tomorrow in the morning. Uh, I might do a Bible study or something like that. And so take care, and God bless you. <laughs>